This segment of Hack5 is brought to you by GoToAssist. I'm very passionate about the network of networks, and I think that's key here, because the internet is nothing more than all of us. Like, if all of us, raise your hand if you don't have a network at home. That's what I thought, right? And if all of us were able to network our networks, it would be an internet, and that would be pretty fantastic. So, the internet, though, uh, has a rich heritage, and I'm gonna try to breeze through this, but uh, basically it was born out of a Department of Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or you know, ARPA, you've heard of ARPANET from 1969. Uh, it, was, it adopted the internet protocol suite that we all know and love today, TCP IP, back in 1982, like a year before I was born, so that was awesome. And so, you know, congrats, hats off to all of those guys that, you know, and, and, and our government, you know, for putting the dollars behind it to come up with that, because, you know, I love America. It's the best nation. Um, well, anyway, so IANA. As far as internet governance is concerned, like I said, if this is just a network of networks and all of us geeks in this room can figure out how we could use token ring, we could use IPX if we really wanted to be masochistic, we could network our networks, right? But ultimately, as far as the internet that we're familiar with is concerned, the only real governance of what makes it what we know today is the domain name system, the IP address system. And so somebody needed to maintain that because before this authority, what there was was host. It wasn't even host.txt, I believe. It was just, well, now it lives in slash Etsy slash host on Unix. It lives in, what, C Windows, System32, uh, Etsy drivers, something else on Windows. I don't know where it is on OS X. But the host file, was literally just a text file that said, here's the website, here's the IP address, you know, here's how you get to this site. And people would just update this. And so when you got on the internet and you put a new server on the internet, you just update this and there was a central authority and some guy maintained the host file. Can you imagine, just some guy? And then everybody would just download the new version and yeah, look at all the new sites that are available. So DNS changed everything, and so somebody needs to run it, and so IANA does that. IANA was contracted by the Department of Defense, and then in, um, in 1998, uh, this company was founded, uh, actually not far from here, in uh, uh, Santa Barbara, I want to say? No, uh, Marina uh, Del Rey. Marina Del Rey, the okay. Tricec Towers. Yeah. Del Rey, okay, so not far from here at all, um, to oversee internet operations. You see, the, um, the internet was privatized in 1995 when the National Science Foundation stopped the, uh, the last uh, uh, backbone, but ICANN uh, took over authority of IANA. And other such organizations came around at the same time to, uh, to volunteer, like volunteer organizations of private industry and civil society, the Internet Engineering Task Force. You know, they, they make RFCs and specifications for all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, the Internet Governance Forum and many other organizations like these have been governing the Internet back before the United Nations thought that it was theirs. Um, and ICON, ICANN, they actually work for these guys. The Department of Commerce actually pretty much runs the Internet. This is actually why when I was in the United Nations watching this, I could totally understand why these nation states like Czech Republic and Russian Federation and stuff look at the Internet and they're like, dude, that's the United States thing. You know? Because ultimately, ICANN answers to these guys. When ICANN wants to make a new you know, top-level domain, when they want triple X, these guys have to approve it. They can update the list all they want, but ultimately, um, our government runs the internet. Um, even though we you know, allude that it's, it's so private, because in 1995, these guys, the National Science Foundation, ended the, uh, the last, um, the last uh, government major backbone, you know, and this, this ushered in the privatization. You, know, you remember like Prodigy, and AOL, and Errols, and uh, help me out, there's so many more of these. Um, CompuServe, um, even Microsoft, what was that, MSN, anyway, so 1995 was a good year for the internet. Um, you know, le at the time, the backbone was actually 56K, believe it or not. Uh, and then it upgraded to a T1, a T3, now we've got OC192s, I don't even know what's after that, but as a phone geek, I'm into that because the internet has gone from like, slow as balls, to we're streaming and we, we get upset when we can only get 720p streaming. So, yeah. Uh, so that was the privatization of the internet. And now, that was, so that was 1995. Let's take a step way back to 1948. This is uh, Eleanor 
Roosevelt holding a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Rights. And you're probably wondering, how does this tie into the internet? Well, you see, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed by uh, the uh, United Nations. Uh, there was actually 48 nations in favor, zero against, eight abstained. Those were the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, SSR, a bunch of others that end in SSR. You get the idea. Uh, South Africa. Uh, but basically, they passed this, what is human rights for humanity, right? Not just some nation's rights, but these are what, you know, we should all expect. And there's this one article that's very important that I feel to the internet, which is about the uh, freedom of expression. And so it says, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any medium and regardless of frontiers. That's our universal um, you know, freedom of expression, which if you've looked at the internet, it's a fantastic place for freedom of expression, you know, in every single way. You know, everything from hamster dance to YouTube comments, and, and I believe in it all. So, in 2011, the UN did this, this special report talking about blocking of the internet, talking about filtering of the internet. They actually did this survey. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the report's not that interesting. You really have to read, the read between the lines when it comes to the stuff that comes out of the United Nations because they use weasel words here a lot. And ultimately, all they do is influence policy. They don't make laws. Nation states make laws. Um, but these are you know, the nation states that come together to create policies that influence those. And so they make recommendations and things of that nature as far as you know, not being a douche uh, to the internet. Um, but basically, this is talking about the internet enabling that basic human right of expression. Well, not all countries are so uh, down with that, but some are. These are the countries that have actual laws, not just some United Nations policy, free hippie happy stuff. This is law that you have that, uh, you know, fundamentally internet access is, a, is your right in these nations. Those are the only ones. So hopefully this list will get bigger. In uh, 2012, the Internet Society did a survey asking people if they believed that access to the Internet should be a basic human right. I'm very surprised that this wasn't 100% strongly agree. Who are these people that somewhat strongly disagree? What? Well, the Internet has done so much to transform our lives, not just freedom of expression, but it has done a lot to change industry. And I think this is actually pretty apt here in LA. Uh, anything that can be digitized can have its industry totally decimated, just like the buggy whip industry with the automobile. And that's fine, you know, um, adapt, right? Uh, this is the cost of progress and this, this will usher in more awesome, right? Hopefully one day I get a replicator and I can order Earl Grey hot. So my hope is that the internet can actually be, remain truly free and open and can remain untouched by internet or by, by uh, uh, corporate and government uh, interests and that cyberspace can actually transcend these, these borders uh, and be granted some sort of sovereignty because I consider you know, that, that these nation states enjoy and, and enjoy the kind of rights where like, every human is actually having equal opportunity online. It's so great because when I go on IRC, everyone is green text on a black background. Everyone is judged by what they say, not, you know, to quote the mentor, you know, we exist without nationality, without skin color, without religious bias. The internet has that dream. It transcends those old school borders, uh, or at least that is my hope. My fear, of course, is that the internet is seen as a resource, okay? It's seen as a resource and will be bent to the will of the state and the corporation and used to control access to how, what, who has access to what information, for domestic spying, uh, to engage in information warfare, to otherwise oppress citizens. It's totally uncool. This kind of leads into internet censorship because this is actually a, an issue where, well, I mean, everybody's going to have a different opinion on it because would you say it's okay to limit or filter internet access in a library, in a public library, in a, in a public school? What about on a corporate network? When you go, you know, if you're working for the man, and you go to your cubicle and you're using their machine on their network, shouldn't they be able to say what access you have? Okay, 
I mean, I go back and forth on this, but when it comes to your home, right? When you're, when you're at your home, I believe you should have, I don't know, not only just the Fourth Amendment, you know, um, uh, but you should have freedom of expression, freedom of speech, right? So, other countries don't see it that way. Uh, China, known for their great firewall of China, employs things like IP blocking, DNS filtering, packet filtering, man in the middle attacks, they'll actually drop connections, do TCP resets, uh, they, they block any VPNs or SSH traffic out of the, uh, the country. Uh, I forget what country it is that's mandating, uh, it was, no, it's North Korea, just said, it's okay to use a VPN now in North Korea. You can use this VPN, North <laughs> Korea. <laughs> Way to go, guys. Yeah. Uh, but if you go to China, good luck Googling Tiananmen Square protests in 1989. It's just not going to show any results. Man, this time of the year, it seems like everyone is trying to get away from the office. I know I am. Vacations, enjoying the warmer weather. But listen, if you're working in IT, as man, so many of us are, it is a challenge. It's not a challenge enough when users are there, but they always need support. Network systems, they always need management. And this is why I recommend GoToAssist by Citrix. So they have these three essential support tools all in one easy to use integrated cloud-based platform. You've got the GoToAssist remote support, which, let, which lets you provide live or unattended support to any PC, Mac, or mobile device from anywhere even from their iPad or Android device with the free app. So you can take your time away from the office too. I know I've used it plenty of times in a pinch and it is so great, it works beautifully. Plus, with GoToAssist monitoring, you can actually be really proactive, identify those issues before they come up, before your boss is breathing down your neck. And you can easily keep track of it all from the GoToAssist service desk. So sign up for your special 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToAssist.com. Click on the Try It Free button and use the promo code HACK5. That's GoToAssist.com, promo code H-A-K-5. Time for the Technoless photo of the week, and this one comes from Joe. He sends us a photo of his setup, including an Acer box, a Linux machine, or one or two of those, and tons of other little devices all around the room. Now, thank you so much, Joe, for sending in that photo, and awesome that you're watching the newest episode of Hack 5. You can always share yours by email us, e emailing us over at feedback at hack5.org with the subject line Technolest.